Thank you. Gosh, I, I get tired out just hearing all that stuff. Man alive. Well, I want to tell you, I'm going to start out like this. I love Calvary chapels. You guys are fabulous. I've spoken at Calvary chapels all over the country and also in the UK. And every time I go, I meet a, a, pass, a passel of people that just love Jesus. They're overflowing with Christ, very committed. And uh, it's just fabulous to be with you. In fact, you, you, most of you probably don't know this, but I became a Christian uh, almost 49 years ago, September 28th, 1973. Uh, and two, that was a Friday night. And two weeks later, the very first church that I crossed the threshold of was Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. Hey. Now, that wasn't my home church at the time, but I went up there for a conference and uh, it actually wasn't a conference, it was a, a concert. You know, they had the Friday night's concerts during Jesus Movement and all of that stuff. And that explosion of the Jesus Movement that Chuck Smith and Calvary Chapels were so uh, central to. And uh, it was just magnificent. Now, to show that God has a kind of a sense of humor, the irony is, in that same building that holds 2,000 people, for the last six or seven years, in the last week in September, Stand to Reason has been hosting a youth conference, and actually before the government interfered with our attendance, we had 2,600 students on campus there at our apologetics conference that we call Reality. So, wow, there were more kids that we were able to put into that chapel and in their gym than were there that night that I first attended. So, I am absolutely awed by the, what God has done and also what He continues to do through the Calvary chapels all over the world. So uh, it's a really a treat for me to talk with you, you guys here. And incidentally, I did a conference um, yesterday in apologetics, and we sold out almost all the books and then discovered another box of books that were underneath the table. So if you tried to get a hold of the tactics book, a game plan for discussing your Christian convictions, and you weren't able to. We still have about 20 more on the table out in the back, so you can grab it on your way out if you like to. Or you can grab it if you don't want it either. That would be fine with me. <clears throat> a number of years ago, when Bruce Jenner walked across the stage there in that blue gown and received the Arthur Ashe Award for Courage, at Standard Reason, we began getting a, a lot of emails from Christians who were confused. And so my staff began to press me about, why don't we do a video where you respond to the uh, Bruce Jenner issue and, and the broader issue of gender dysphoria, et cetera. And I, I said, well, why, why do we need to do that? Because it seems to me the issues are fairly clear. But it turned out more and more Christians in our broader Santa Reason community were asking about this and wondering and seemed confused. So I, I went ahead and I made the video, and it was a very simple principle that I offered them. And what I said was, Bruce Jenner, tragically, is confused. Bruce Jenner is a broken human being that will be broken for the rest of his life. It's a terrible circumstance. For him. Bruce Jenner is confused. Hollywood is confused. The educational establishment is confused. They're all confused, but that doesn't mean that we need to be confused. But lately I've been mystified not just about confusion on that issue, but mystified by what appears to be a trend of confusion by a lot of people within the body of Christ on a number of different issues. Uh, these, are, uh, these are people who uh, identify themselves as Christians but are, are completely comfortable with the idea that some people believe in other religions and that's just fine. Jesus is their way of salvation, but other people have their way of salvation, and that's okay. They tend to be uh, sexually active, especially as single persons. It's not a problem to them. They are generally gay-affirming uh, and gay-friendly, and I don't mean just friendly to gays. That's totally appropriate, but they are affirming of the lifestyle. It's not troublesome to them. Alternate sexualities, 
no problem. And they're uh, consequently okay with same-sex marriage, and they tend to be pro-choice as well. So there are these, with, now I'm talking about within the body of Christ, people who identify as Christians, and these are all these things that they're going along with, which I see as like, well, they're hanging out in all these critical issues, and they believe just like everyone else outside of the church believes. And I'll tell you why this troubles me. I'm distressed because they've fallen into a trap that the Apostle Paul warned about. In Colossians 2, Paul says, do not be taken captive by philosophy and empty deception. Now, he's not talking about philosophy in general. I have a master's degree in philosophy. It's helped me tremendously as a follower of Christ. He's not concerned with the discipline of philosophy. He's Concerned with something else. Do not be taken captive by philosophy and empty deception according to the traditions of men. According to the elementary principles of the world rather than according to Christ. In other words, what he's saying is there's basically two ways to look at the world. You could look at it Jesus' way or every other way. Man's way, characteristically. And human beings get it wrong especially on the critical issues. But way, the ways that they get it wrong are appealing. They are satisfying. There's social pressures that um, entice us to go along with it. And Paul says, don't be taken captive. Don't be taken captive. Have your guard up. Be careful. And I'm kind of mystified by this whole trend because with regards to these issues and more, there's actually no good reason biblically for the confusion because Scripture speaks with clarity on these issues. I understand there are a lot of theological issues we have differences of opinion on. The age of the earth, the book of Revelation, sovereignty, free will, all kinds of things that are legitimate areas of discussion and maybe some uncertainty among Christians, and we knock it around. We still all get around. We all get along. But on these issues, these aren't ambiguous. These aren't gray areas. I mean, the fact is, on a host of culturally charged moral and spiritual issues, faithfulness for Christians is not theologically complicated. Faithfulness is not theologically complicated, and that's the title of this talk, and I think it's a really lousy title. Nothing clever about it, all right? But it's apt. It's appropriate because people are confused. Why are they confused? And I think there's two reasons here. One of them is that there are many who claim to be Christians who are foundering on fundamentals because they don't know the fundamentals. They just are not biblically literate. They, they are not taught how to understand the Bible in their context, which, by the way, I think is a strength of Calvary chapels. You guys get it, verse by verse by verse. You don't do all these topical stuff. You do these books, you know, and chapters. You get it. And so that protects you, but there are a lot of people that don't do that. They pick and choose, and they find the things that sound good to them, and they misunderstand it much of the time. No theological depth. But there's another reason, too. It's not just that they're untutored in the basics, but a lot of Christians, and especially those of the younger generation, sadly, care more about what their friends think about them than what Jesus thinks about them. Now, each of these failings, the lack of spiritual depth and caring too much about what other people think, individually are dangerous, but in combination, they are spiritually deadly. So I want to talk about those five things that I think Christians unfortunately are confused about today, and I want to erase the confusion. What I'm not going to do is I'm not going to do apologetics here. That is, I'm not going to talk to you uh, about how you as a follower of Christ can make sense of these ideas to the rest of the world. That's a different project. I just want to show you from the text, from Scripture, that the Bible is not ambiguous on these concepts, all right? And hopefully, maybe some of the clarity that I offer from the text will lessen the confusion and maybe breed some courage in some of you that are just a little bit frightened about facing the culture, which, by the way, I understand completely. It's tough out there. And so the temptation is to 
hide or maybe modify our views with other people a little bit instead of simply standing tall. doesn't mean we have to go out and start fights with people. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about being faithful in our own convictions about what the Bible teaches is actually true in these controversial areas. So let's start. First things first, and I want to talk about Jesus and salvation. And that Jesus of Nazareth is necessary, or I should to be more specific, putting your trust in Him is necessary to escape the judgment of God for your rebellion and crimes against Him is gospel bedrock. It is the foundation of Christianity. If we remove the idea of Jesus being the only way of salvation, there is nothing left. If Jesus is just our flavor if it's like, try him, see if you like him. If you don't like him, try something else. Maybe you like that, but I like Jesus. Jesus didn't come here so that you would like him. God came down from heaven to rescue you from the wrath you deserve for breaking his law. Now, that's pretty unvarnished. I'm just making it clear. That is all through the Scriptures. Unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. He who believes is not judged, but he who does not believe the wrath of God abides on him. That's Jesus. This is serious business. And sometimes we talk about it like, yeah, well, we all know we all messed up. You didn't mess up. You've rebelled every single, single day of your life against the holy sovereign of the universe. And by the way, I'm with you in that. We all have. We didn't just mess up. And Jesus came to rescue us. That's why he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That's not ambiguous. And if you think it is, that statement at the end of his ministry, John 14, 6, how about this, what he said at the beginning? Enter through the narrow gate. Pretty straightforward. For the gate is wide, the way is broad, that leads to destruction. Strong word. Jesus, meek and mild, that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through that gate. But the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. You see, Jesus wasn't a pluralist. You never notice that uh, all these other religions want to get Jesus on their team. They all want to make Jesus, Jesus the prophet of Allah, or Jesus one of the many gods in Hinduism, or, uh, or an avatar, or, or New Age avatars. They all want Jesus on their team. Jesus doesn't want to be in anybody else's team. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. He didn't have any respect for that. Why? Because he understood what reality was like. And by the way, it wasn't just Jesus who said these things, but those who Jesus trained to follow after him. Uh, right after Pentecost, uh, within a couple of months of Jesus being crucified, Peter's out there preaching the gospel, and he's telling Jews, now keep in mind, these are really religious people. They got their own religion. Why don't we leave them alone? Because they're not safe from God, even in their own religion. Why? Because they've rejected the Messiah that God has provided for their forgiveness. And so Peter says, there, just so there's no confusion about this, fellas, there is salvation and none other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And if you don't like it, lump it. Oh, it's kind of a paraphrase. <laughs> but he does say something like that. And you have to decide whether it's right to obey God rather than men. But we can't stop speaking that which we've seen and heard. Uh, by the way, it's interesting what Peter, this is in Acts chapter 4, Peter doesn't say we cannot stop talking about our faith. He doesn't use that language. Nowadays, of course, it's very easy to dismiss Christians faith, their belief. Well, you have your little leap. That isn't what Peter says. Peter says we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. 
And of course, largely what they communicated was the resurrection of Christ. In other words, they were offering evidence. They weren't offering just their feelings of faith. Just a little aside from the apologetics angle. And this kind of claim you can find throughout the text. Actually, at Santa Reason, we have a little red booklet. Get it online. We sold a bunch of them yesterday. They're all gone. It's called Jesus the Only Way, 100 verses. You know, there's 100 verses in the New Testament that teach that Jesus is the only way. There are nine lines of argument that the New Testament pursues on that personal issue. Is that controversial? Sure. This is probably the most annoying thing for non-Christians regarding Christians. You think you guys are right. Yeah, we do. That's what Jesus said. And if I follow Jesus, then I say what Jesus said on important issues. But there's a reason for it. It wasn't bigotry. It wasn't hate. It wasn't narrow-mindedness. It wasn't intolerance. There's a reason why Jesus said He was the only way, and the reason is He's the only one who solved the problem. Let me say it again. It's really important. The reason Jesus is the only way is because He's the only one who solved the problem. Singular problems, like this problem of evil, often have singular solutions. If you're in medicine, you know what I'm talking about. Even if you're not in medicine, you know what I'm talking about. It's common sense. Some problems are so deep and so bad that there's not a plethora of different options for you. There's one option. Get the operation or die. Your choice. Maybe that's what the doctor will say, because that's reality. Same thing here. You don't want Jesus? All right, I get it. You're going to stand before him and give an account for your life. And guess what? That's not going to be a pretty picture because he's got this book and he's going to open this book. And you know what's in the book? Every single thing you ever did wrong. It's right there, Revelation 20. I call it the books of death. He's making a list and he's checking it twice. He doesn't miss anything. And what you're going to get is perfect justice, which is punishment for everything you've done wrong. And God misses nothing. Now, there's an alternative. And he offers it. He offers it now, not then. And the offer now is perfect mercy, forgiveness for everything you've ever done wrong. And God misses nothing. It's up to you then. There it is. Choose this day. You want life or you want death? It's up to you. Either Jesus pays for your sins or you do. That's the calculus. Controversial? Yeah. Confusing? Absolutely not. It's right there in black and white. There's only one answer to the Philippian jailer's question, what must I do to be saved? Paul gave it, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Simple, straightforward, uncomplicated, unambiguous. Don't be confused. Number one. Okay, two. I'm going to start this section, introduce it with a few statistics that you might not have thought about. On September 11, 2001, which, by the way, you have to be 25 years or older to even have a recollection of that. Isn't that amazing? Because I know for some of you, it's just like it happened yesterday. 2,977 people were murdered in one day by Muslim terrorists. Here's something you don't know. More than that, 2,977, more lives than that have been taken every single day for almost 50 years since Roe versus Wade through abortion. I want you to think about 21,316 9-11 days of death back to back. In America, there are 388,000 blacks, black Africans who were enslaved over two and a half centuries. Americans killed that many children through abortion in 109 days. And I can go on and on with comparisons. I realize that Scripture does not address abortion directly, but it does weigh in decisively 
And so I want to sketch that out for you. I think the issue of abortion falls under a broader biblical injunction. It's the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. Now, there's a reason we should murder, and it comes before the law. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, if man sheds man's blood, then by man his blood shall be shed. So that's capital punishment. For in the image of God, God created man. So right there in Genesis 9, after the flood, we have a declaration of capital punishment for murder because human beings are really special. They are made in the image of God. And by the way, that idea goes all the way back to the first chapter, that God created them in human beings in His image. Because we are image bearers, we have transcendent value and our lives are infinitely valuable and ought to be protected. So here's our question with regards to abortion. Are unborn human beings also image bearers in the sense that God was referring to in Genesis? Okay, that's our question. Or maybe another way of putting it is, in God's eyes, and this is what we're trying to figure out from God's perspective now, in God's eyes, are humans before they are born the very same individuals as they are after they are born, because after they're born, if they're protected by the sixth, uh, sixth amendment, I'm sorry, the sixth commandment, and they are the same ones before they are born, they should be protected in the same way because they're the same individuals, just in a different location, still made in the image of God. Now, that's our question, and I want to answer that question biblically, because you may be surprised to discover that Scripture does give a definitive answer to that question that is clear, unambiguous, and decisive. Take in your, look in your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. Now, you might wonder, why is he going to the birth narratives to talk about abortion? Because normally we go to the Old Testament in Proverbs or in Psalms or something like that, you know, forget about that. That's too ambiguous. I want to give you a rock-solid biblical argument regarding this issue. That's why I'm going to the birth narratives. In Luke chapter 1, we have Zacharias first going in the temple, receiving a revelation uh, that he is going to bear a son who will be a forerunner to the Messiah, and that son will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still where? In his mother's womb. And then we see Mary... Actually, uh, Elizabeth does conceive, and then six months later, Mary is visited by Gabriel, and she has promised a miraculous conception, and she conceives Jesus. She's told that Elizabeth also is pregnant, and so she goes to see Elizabeth. Now, remember, Elizabeth is in her second trimester, six months. Mary is in her first trimester. When Mary and Elizabeth greets, something amazing happens, and it's recorded in Luke 1, 41 through 44. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby, wait, the what? The baby, no duh, right? Leaped in her womb. This is Elizabeth's baby. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, who's this baby? This is the baby that was prophesied to Zacharias who would be filled with the Holy Spirit while what? Still in his mother's womb. This is a fulfillment of that. And she cried out with a loud voice and said to Mary, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. The what? Fruit of your womb. What's that? Keep reading. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord not the future mother, the mother of my Lord. According to Elizabeth, filled with the Spirit, what is the fruit of Mary's womb? The Lord. And who is that? The Lord Jesus. How is it that the mother of my Lord would come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. Okay, watch this. 
Mary comes to Elizabeth. Mary calls out to Elizabeth. Elizabeth hears the words. The baby, John, leaps in her womb for joy for being in the presence of the Lord Jesus. OMG. Now, we usually say G for gosh, but wait a minute. No, it's OMG, like the capital G. Oh, my God. That's why John was jumping for joy. He was in the presence of God in the person of Jesus. So my question again. <clears throat> John, the fetus, filled with the Holy Spirit, leaping with joy in the presence of the embryo Jesus. Were John the Baptist and Jesus the same selves before they were born as they were after they were born? Of course. According to God's Word, they were. That means if Mary or Elizabeth would have had an abortion, then Mary or Elizabeth would have killed Jesus or John. Not a future Jesus or John, not a possible Jesus or John, not a potential Jesus or John. They would have killed Jesus and John. Therefore, abortion is a violation of the Sixth Commandment. Abortion is murder in God's eyes. Now, I have to add something here, because I'd be a fool if I thought there weren't dozens of people in this room that have not been directly and personally affected by abortion in their life. And so I want you to understand two things. First of all, I want, to, uh, well, I want you all to understand the gravity of this issue. And for those who have whatever experience with that, I am not going to protect you right now. I would not be doing you a service if I did. And maybe you're feeling really bad about the first thing, the point I made. That's why I want you to hear the second thing. Is murder forgivable? Absolutely. Saul was a murderer. I mean, Saul of Tarsus. He was the greatest of sinners, he said, but was forgiven so that this would demonstrate how the mercy of God towards others. I have a favorite psalm verse that is going to be on my tombstone. I've said it so many times publicly and on the air that my wife can't miss it. Everybody's going to be mad because they've heard me say this, Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4. And there it says, and you want to think about this, no matter what your background, it says, Lord, if you would mark iniquity, if you're keeping track, who could stand? Oh, Lord, who could stand? If God is keeping track of my sins, I have no hope. That was the point I made a few moments ago. And then the psalmist says, but there is forgiveness with you so that you might be praised. Is there guilt? Yes, there's guilt. We're all guilty of one thing or another, some more than others, but enough to result in our everlasting separation from God. And that's why mercy is necessary for all of us, and it's available even for those who have taken the lives of other human beings. Mercy, forgiveness, so that God would be praised. Do not be confused. The culture is confused. There's no need for you to be confused on this. Now, this takes me to the next issue, but I want to uh, start out this way by acknowledging or noting that there's something that everybody knows about the world, no matter how, uh, uh, where they live or when they lived. Everybody knows that the world is broken. We call this, problem, call this the problem of evil. We all know that something is wrong with the world. But it wasn't always like that. There was a time before the world was broken, when God had made the world a particular way and everything was just the way it's supposed to be, and it was all working together just so, before the darkness, before the evil descended. And Genesis tells us the way that world was. 
the way God formed it so that we would flourish as human beings. A world that he called very, very good. And here's what we read in Genesis 1, 27 and 28. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. That's what we were talking about a moment ago. Male and female, he created them. Full stop. Pay attention. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. I want you to notice that in God's world, sex is binary. This is not politically correct, but it is reality. By the way, you do not need to have a Bible to know this. Everybody has known this for thousands and thousands of years because that is the way human beings can be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, right? I, I feel embarrassed to even talk like this because it's so obvious, I feel silly. But this is the culture is really confused on this. Now, there is a sliver of the population, an almost infinitesimally small sliver that struggles genuinely with gender dysphoria. It is virtually non-existent, but it is there, and it is tragic. These are people who need to be loved and cared for and graciously treated. But it's not a condition to be encouraged. Yet in this culture, that whole thing has become a cause celeb, right? And now it is a, what's called a social contagion. It is a fad. And it is being encouraged all over the country, not just by Hollywood, but by our entire educational system from the top to the bottom. LAUSD, it's all built in right now in all their curriculum. It's not just in the academy, it's in kindergarten. What business has the government in sexualizing our children down to kindergarten. This is political indoctrination. There is no excuse for it. And you know who got really, really mad about this? You'll never believe it. Bill Maher. You know Bill Maher, the comedian? Politically incorrect. He's not a leftist. He's a liberal. He's not a Christian. He doesn't like Christians. But he is hopping mad about this. And about a month or five weeks ago, some of you might have seen it. He did a 10-minute, uh, 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 whatever, rant. And it was really funny. You can find it on YouTube. It's not hard to find. Just say, just go ahead and type in Bill Maher rants against LGBTQ or something like that. And you're going to get it. And it's funny, but he's saying it like it is. And everybody's laughing because it's so obvious and what he is saying is, we are experimenting on our children sexually. And we should not be doing that. So this is a very big issue right now in culture. But uh, it's important for you to see that even though there's confusion in the culture, there's not a confusion in the Scripture. Every male in the Bible is called a he. Every female is called a she. Sex is binary. By the way, there's no difference between a, a physical sex and, a, in, a, in a sense, a psychological gender in Scripture. They are synonyms because they're synonyms in reality. I had a conversation. I'm, I'm, I'm always a little reluctant to say this, but it makes a point. I'm having a conversation with a pastor. I was back on the East Coast with a pastor who's driving me to church, and his 14-year-old daughter is in the back seat, and we're talking about this back and forth. And I'm just saying it's so obvious that gender is binary. Sex is binary. And the gal, 14-year-old gal in the back seat, pipes up, and she said, yeah, I just tell my friends to check your pants. <laughs> now, it's a little coarse, and I don't mean to be disrespectful at all, but it does make the point that even a 14-year-old can figure it out because it's obvious. And again, you don't need a Bible to know this. 
God's plan is that men and women were made both physically and emotionally different from each other in order to fit together in a complementary way, a suitable helpmate. This is a good plan. It's not a bad plan. It's a good plan. Things can get a little rough a little bit in that relationship. I get it. But it's a good plan. It, it promotes human flourishing. And when we go against God's good plan, then we don't flourish. Scripture is not ambiguous or unclear on this, which is why no one Christian or otherwise has been confused for thousands of years. Gender is not fluid in the way that people say it is. Imaginations are fluid, not gender. Okay? Google says 50 genders. Well, why not 100? Why not 1,000? Again, I, 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 please understand, I'm not trying to be disrespectful to people who disagree with me. I'm just I'm making an appeal, in, on the one hand, to common sense, and on the other hand, to followers of Christ, to the text. This is not hard. Don't be confused. Now, binary sexuality is also key to understanding God's purpose for something else that culture has been confused about. And I want to point you to Matthew 19, verse 4 and 5, so you can mark that and turn there if you like, because Jesus was asked a question about marriage. Uh, actually, he was asked a question about divorce, so he, gave a, he answered the question about divorce by giving a characterization of what God intended marriage to be. He doesn't just deal with the problem. He says, let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to where God set the whole thing up. The system that God made that he called good, that was for the purpose of human flourishing. And here's what he says to the Pharisees who raised the issue, or actually kind of trying to trap him a little bit, because there is a provision in the Mosaic Covenant for divorce meant to protect the woman. But it's there because of the hardness of heart that, of the men. This is what Jesus is saying. But from the beginning, it hasn't been that way. Now listen to his words. Have you not read? Okay, let's pause for a minute. Have you not read? So there's a chastisement right out of the gate here because these are religious folk that are supposed to know better because right in the very beginning, the basic plan is laid out. So there's a sense in which with regards to the, the confusion in our culture about the nature of marriage, Jesus could say to the culture, at least to the church, have you not read? Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Binary sexuality. And he said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, binary sexuality, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's sex, by the way. They leave, they cleave, become one flesh. Implicitly, actually it's like stronger than implicit, <laughs> sex is for marriage, for that union. So let me sum up Jesus' understanding of marriage here in a very easy way to remember it. Here's what he said. One man with one woman becoming one flesh for one lifetime. One man with one woman becoming one flesh for one lifetime. Now, what's curious about this formula, which is a summary of what Jesus just said, is that it covers all the alternate sexualities. People say, well, Jesus never said anything about homosexuality. We actually don't know that because most of what Jesus said isn't recorded. What you could say is, well, Jesus, we don't have any record of what Jesus said about homosexuality, but come on, he's a Torah-observant Jew. You think he's really going to march in a pro-gay parade? I mean, this is not realistic. And again, I'm not being disparaging, but think, I'm just thinking of Jesus. You know, he told the woman caught in adultery, go and sin no more. He didn't say that's a good alternate sexuality. But in that statement, every single thing that the Bible prohibits is excluded. 
The Bible prohibits adultery. It prohibits fornication. It prohibits homosexuality, and it prohibits bestiality. All of those four things are sex with someone other than your lifelong spouse. Do you ever figure that out? It's all right there in Jesus' words. It's all captured. He, he does it all in one shot. Now, there's a reason why marriage is restricted, or I, that's not even the right word. Jesus not, does not restrict marriage. What he does is tell us what marriage is so that anything else is not a marriage. Now, just for clarity's sake, and I've been writing on this for 20 years, long before a Burgerfell Supreme Court decision, 2015, trying to figure out a way to make sense of this to people, because everybody had their different ideas about what marriage is. First thing I want you to see is that no uh, same-sex couple has ever been prohibited from cohabiting together, having sex together. Now, that was used to be illegal a long time ago, but I mean, just generally in this era, having sex together, walking down the aisle together, pledging their troth until death do them part kind of thing, setting up housekeeping, all the liberties that same heterosexual couples had. Same-sex couples had the liberties. They could do all of that. Now, what they didn't get is the recognition that their relationship was the same as a heterosexual relationship. And there was a reason why they didn't get the recognition, because they're not the same. Well, we love each other. Marriage is about love. Really? Ask any married couple. <laughs> it's not about love. Love may be the reason that you got married. It isn't the reason for your union. But there is a reason why cultures characteristically have privileged and protected heterosexual marriage. Okay, and here's the reason why. It took me a long time to work these words out to cover all the pushback. There's a reason why. I gotta find it here so I get it all right. The reason why is that as a group, as a rule, there are exceptions. By nature, it's the way bodies work, and I'd say by design, so I'm throwing in the divine element, but you don't even need that to make the point. As a group, as a rule, by nature, long-term monogamous heterosexual marriages produce the next generation. And culture cares about that. And this is why they protect it with laws and they privilege it. Same-sex unions don't do that. They don't provide that for culture. There's no reason to privilege it. And there's certainly no reason to say that it's the same as, because it's not the same. And what Obergefell did in SCOTUS in 2015 is they made marriage into nothing but names on a piece of paper. That's all it is. It's just names on paper. That's all it is. And, of course, when you take an ax to a critical foundation of civilization, you're only going to get trouble. One of the Supreme Court justices during the discussion in 2015 said, you know what, maybe we should slow down a little bit because the idea of same-sex marriage isn't even as old as a cell phone. Maybe people in the past had a good idea about things, and uh, I think they're right. There's nothing ambiguous about Jesus' view. There's nothing ambiguous about the Scripture's view. Culture is confused. Don't you be confused. And this being, see, to the last point, and I have to move quickly on this one because we're almost out of time, but according to Jesus, in marriage, a man cleaves to and becomes one flesh with a woman, his wife. Their physical bodies are joined in a deep and profound sexual union of body and soul, and that's the good plan of God. This is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians that you shouldn't get involved in with a harlot because your body is a temple of the Spirit. Now, most Christians, frankly, misunderstand that. They think, well, if my body is a temple, if your body is a temple of the Spirit, why are you making it into a pizza hut? You know, that kind of thing. Well, it's not talking about physical health. It's not talking about your diet. It has nothing to do with that. The way your physical body is physically has nothing to do with your spirituality. 
If that were the case, every sick person would be a bad temple. That's silly. Paul is talking about something else. He said, you do not join that body with a harlot. Because when you become joined with her, you become one flesh with her, and you are a temple of the Spirit. That means you're joining your spiritual union with Christ with a harlot. Don't do it. That's the rationale there. And unfortunately, in our culture right now, it's an anything goes culture. Well, here's what I want you to see. This is the main thing. I'm going to talk about homosexuality in just a minute, but I want you to see this is symptomatic of a larger concern. God made sex for a particular purpose and a function a certain way so that it would be safe and it would allow for our flourishing. I just got to do a sidebar here. We got to, This is the last service, right? Uh, my flight doesn't leave till Wednesday anyway, so... Yesterday, I got a text. Yesterday, I got a text from my son, who is a 40-year-old ER nurse. So he stays on top of all the medical stuff. The text was, from the New, was a piece from the New England Journal of Medicine, N-E-J-M. They just did a big study on the monkeypod virus, the new thing that is sweeping the world. This is the new catastrophe. What did they find? 98% of those who have monkeypod virus are homosexuals or bisexual men. 98%. Guess what? No women. No women. That suggests that maybe 2% were lying. But this is going to be the new deal, you know. The sky is falling. Government's going to come in and lay down. I, I could be wrong about this, but, you know, I just have a sense this is what's coming. But it's, it, what it, it's, it's because of behavior that is inconsistent with God's plan for human flourishing that this disease is now coming upon us. And anyway, the point is, is that God made a plan, and all of these variations are violation of the plan. So any of these variations, whether it's homosexuality, or whether it's adultery, or whether it's forn fornication, or whether it's bestiality, I mean, these are the group. It's a way of saying no to God. No, 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 no. I want what I want. I'm going to do it my way. Now, I'm going to look at homosexuality. I'm going to look at one verse, because this is characteristic of this, this refusal to do things God's way. And this is precisely what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, so you can turn there. Now, I'm reading out the New American Standard Bible, and I'm using the New American Standard because there is a nuance of translation that some of the other translations do not get, and it creates confusion and ambiguity. So I'm going to read to you from chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, but let's step back a little bit and look what's going on there in the last half of chapter 1 of Romans. Paul is talking about the revelation of God to all of humanity. So not, not everybody knows about Jesus, but everybody knows about the Father. This is what Paul's saying. It's obvious, but what, what is the response of sinful human beings? They suppress the truth with unrighteous motives. They don't want God. They're going to suppress it. They're going to worship the creature rather than the Creator. And one of the ways they do this is in their sexual behavior. And what's kind of interesting, Paul says, when they push away from God to do their own thing, God pushes them away from Him. You get that? The phrase is, He gave them over. He's not causing them to do it. He's releasing His restraints so they can just, they can stew in it. But when He does that, what is a characteristic? Well, they are sexual Pardon the word, perversion. This is, I'm using the word advisedly. It's, it is a perversion of God's perfect plan. And it's, it's not just one kind of, it's all these other prohibited sexualities are a perversion of the plan. But he looks specifically at homosexuality and does mention lesbianism too. It's the only place in the Bible where it's mentioned, Romans chapter 1. So let me read these verses. 26 and 27, God gave them over to degrading passions. Notice how he characterizes it. These are degrading passions. The men abandon the natural function of the woman 
and burned in their desire toward one another. They abandoned the natural function. Now, this is where the ambiguity comes up in some of the translations. The word function there is the Greek word krisis. Krisis means function. Paul is talking about plumbing. He is not talking about natural or unnatural desires. He is talking about the way God made the bodies to fit together. And Paul is saying, God made a woman to satisfy a man sexually. They fit together. They function that way well. And men said no and burned in their desire towards one another. And women said no and burned in their desire toward one another. All of this is saying no to God's plan. And since the natural desires go with natural functions, the sexual passion that exchanges the natural function of sex for an unnatural function is what Paul calls a degrading passion. And it's not just homosexuality. This is why Scripture has nothing positive to say about homosexuality. It has nothing positive to say about adultery. It has nothing positive to say about fornication. It has nothing positive to say about bestiality. These are not part of God's purpose. And here is Paul's sobering summary, and this is to the church. You find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Do you not know? Sounds like Jesus, right? Have you not read? Do you not know? Wait a minute. Wake up, Corinthians. That the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then he goes on with a list of sins. So I got ellipses in my own citation here because I'm just looking at the sexual things he mentions because that's my point right now. But there's a lot of other things. You can read it for yourself. Verse 9 and 10 of chapter 6. But here's my shortened version fo focusing on the sex. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators. A fornicator is somebody who is having sex outside of marriage and neither partner is married to anyone. People who live together are fornicators if they're not married. That's what Paul's talking about here. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators nor adulterers, no homosexuals will inherit the kingdom of God. If this is your lifestyle, Paul says, you are on the outside, you are not on the inside. This isn't works-based salvation. He's saying, you are living just like the world. That's because you are like the world spiritually. It's an indicative. Another way of putting it is if you're living like hell, you're probably going there. This is a strong exhortation by Paul about the lifestyle of people in the Corinthian church. It's just not right. But it's interesting, he follows, just like I did a few moments ago, was saying, this is where some of you were like, but you have been washed, you have been cleansed. There's a way out of this, and it's by the grace of God. It's a willingness to say, I am a Christian, and I am going to follow Jesus because I love Jesus, and so I'm going to do that he tells me, the things that he tells me to do, and so I'm going to stop doing the things that I want to do, and I'm going to live the way he wants me to live. That's being a follower of Jesus. And by the way, that is what gives us the confidence that we're really in the Lord. That's what James is talking about in James, James chapter 2. You talk about your faith? You show me your faith without your works, I'll show you my faith by the way that I live. God's solution for satisfying our sexual appetites is marriage. This is not popular right now. And it's not easy even for married people. And everybody who's married out there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not a panacea, it isn't like magic. You got to work at that relationship. But that's where it's supposed to be done. Because that's the safe place for it to happen for the rest of your lives. And it's also safe for kids. So let me close with a, I hope to be a sobering image. I want you to turn to Mark chapter 15, verse 15. Now, this is a passion narrative. Jesus is on trial. Pilate is there trying him, and he does not want to execute Jesus because he knows Jesus is, is innocent. His wife has been crabbing at him. She's been having dreams. Don't mess with this guy. 
but he's got a job to do. And so he's trying to think of a way out. He knows that the Jewish leaders are, 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 are uh, angry because they're, they're jealous of Jesus. And he says, all right, this is the time of year where I let somebody go. I got Jesus, I got Barabbas. Who do you want? He's hoping they're going to say Jesus. But what happened is the religious leaders had already worked up the mob to call for Barabbas, and that's who they call for. And Pilate says, well, what, what should I do with Jesus? And the crowd says, crucify him. Mark 15, verse 15 says this. Mark it. Wishing to please the crowd. Wishing to please the crowd. He released Barabbas and had Jesus scourged and crucified. Dear friends, many in Christendom today are taking their cues from Pilate. They are more concerned with satisfying the crowd than being faithful to Jesus. They champion the criminal and turn their back on their Savior. Don't let it be you. The culture is confused. Don't you be confused. Faithfulness to our Lord is not theologically complicated. Father, we thank you.